Good afternoon, and uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the organizers, uh, the, you know, Dr. Wallin and the Net Research Foundation for the invitation here to talk about uh, uh, PRT, uh, a new horizons. This is my disclosure. Um, PRT, uh, we have talked already about PRT, but let's recapitulate the juice of it. What is it? It is, it is a systemic treatment. It is administered intravenously, divided into multiple cycles, uh, together with the administration of uh, uh, renal protection with amino acids. And what do we administer? We administer a radio-labeled somatostatin uh, analog. And the mechanism of action is the receptor-mediated internalization of this uh, uh, radiopharmaceutical, uh, where the radioactivity becomes trapped inside the cytoplasm. What do we use? Uh, we use these pharmaceuticals that we call theranostics, which is a mixture of the word diagnostic and therapeutic. So basically, we modify a somatostatin analog by attaching a chelator, a sort of basket, which holds inside uh, the radionuclide. And the radionuclide can be either uh, diagnostic, such as gallium-68 for a, a PET-CT, the diagnostic imaging, or lutetium-177 for the uh, therapeutic purposes. Now, first question, is PRT efficacious? Well, it's like asking if the sunrise will be efficacious. Um, so, uh, what do we know uh, about PRT? This is not just uh, uh, about one study. This is about 25 years of clinical trials um, with yttrium-90 and lutetium-177 peptides in gastroenteropancreatic and bronchopulmonary neuroendocrine tumors. We know that it is an efficient treatment. Uh, we observe decrease in tumor size, symptom relief, uh, quality of life improvement, there's a decrease in biomarker levels, an increase in survival, and uh, from the tolerability point of view, it is generally well tolerated. The acute side effects are generally mild, may be related to the amino acids, such as nausea, or to the PRT itself, such as fatigue. Hematological, subacute hematological toxicity is generally low and reversible in the large majority of patients. And the uh, chronic and permanent effects on the target organs like the kidneys and the bone marrows are generally mild if the necessary precautions are taken. Currently, we, the mostly use is the FDA approved one, which is lutetium dotatate. Example here, a patient with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor um, with a liver metastasis. You see in the top row uh, the liver metastasis on the left and on the right the, um, the large pancreatic lesion. In the middle, the intense uptake uh, at lutetium scan. And in the bottom row, you see the response after the treatment. Uh, after PRT, there is uh, a significant improvement uh, in the symptomatic, uh, um, in, in the symptoms such as fatigue, such as diarrhea. Uh, this happens uh, in the, the large majority of patients regardless of the objective response, of the tumor response. Uh, what about the survival? Um, there is, there is a role of disease control, meaning uh, that if patients acquire at least a stabilization of disease after PRRT, um, the patients uh, exhibit a longer uh, survival, greater uh, with a median greater than 48 months, as opposed to patients who do not respond to PRRT. But what does impact on, on, on disease control? We have to take into account the role of FDG, PET CT, which is not always a, um, um, it, it's not a, a, a scan which is only um, used uh, for uh, high-grade neuroendocrine tumors. We can, we can see a lot of G1 and G2 positive tumors. And patients bearing FDG negative uh, lesions uh, have a much longer progression-free survival after PRRT than do patients bearing lesions which exhibit um, uh, metabolism at FDG PET CT. 
The NATO One study has been explained in details this morning. I don't want to go over it, just remind you that this is a, a multicentric randomized trial where the patients randomized to receive uh, PRRT uh, had a 79% reduction of the risk of progression or death compared to the patients receiving uh, standard do uh, double dose octreotide. And there was an impact on the response and the overall survival as well. But what about the other categories of neuroendocrine tumors? Uh, PRT is efficient also in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and this is based on several single arm studies, uh, which provide information on the benefits on tumor response, uh, progression-free survival, and overall survival. And as Dr. Wallin requested this morning, actually these studies demonstrate that the response rate in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is even higher. We're talking about at least 50% of patients. Uh, the same holds true for bronchopulmonary neuroendocrine tumors. Single arm studies demonstrate the benefit. Now, the big question, is PRRT toxic? Well, this is a result of a study that we conducted at my previous institution in uh, Milan, Italy, on uh, more than 800 patients treated with both yttrium and lutetium peptides. Regarding renal toxicity, as you can see, Nephrotoxicity after lutetium pe pe peptide is virtually absent, uh, 0%. And regarding the bone marrow toxicity, myelodysplastic syndromes occurred in 2.3% uh, of patients, but those are, um, values are comparable with uh, uh, antineoplastic therapies such as uh, um, alkylating agents. What's the timing of use uh, for PRRT? Well, it's no use having a boat if the tide has already gone out. We need to know when to go out, when it is time. Well, a few years ago, we wrote a guidance document uh, under the auspices of the International Atomic Energy Agency. This document was endorsed by the European Association of Nuclear Medicine and the American uh, Society. We said that PRT is indicated for a somatostatin receptor positive, a metastatic or inoperable neuroendocrine tumor of the gastroenteropancreatic and bronchial tract, ideally uh, net G1 or G2. Now, the approval of Lutathera uh, in Europe is for gastroenteropancreatic of, um, tumors of grade one and two. In America, it is approved regardless of uh, uh, the grade in uh, GAPNETs. Uh, we know that uh, the NCCN guidelines uh, recommend considering this treatment also in bronchopulmonary neuroendocrine tumors and in pheos and paragangliomas. But when to use PRRT? We can use PRRT in a whole range of situations from end-stage uh, treatment to adjuvant treatments from uh, extensive liver and bone metastatization like in this case, a more typical case like this, uh, this one in the middle, or uh, even adjuvant treatment, so patients with positive net test and uh, biopsy-proven microscopic metastatic disease in the liver. But when it is more likely to be effective? First, let's see when it is more likely to be ineffective. In patients with extensive liver involvement, uh, with a reduced clinical status, weight loss, presence of bone metastasis, so we have to say that PRT is more effective when it is administered earlier in the therapeutic algorithm. But who should get PRT? I think <laughs> Dr. Wallin agrees with me that there are multiple strategies, and I'm sure he agrees that there's a critical need for a molecular predictive strategy to objectively stratify the patients. And uh, <laughs> ideally, uh, I think we all concur that uh, we should treat those patients who are predicted to respond. So we know that somatostatin receptor imaging, in particular a gallium uh, dotate PET scan positivity is fundamental. There is no uh, effect without the delivery of the radiation. However, it is not all. It is not all about the uptake at the PET. We also take into consideration, have to take into consideration the individual tumor characteristics from a biological point of view. So when we see a patient like this, this was a patient of mine back in Italy uh, with, a, as you can see, a diffuse a bone metastasis from a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, intense uptake. We are all uh, happy and we say to the patient, this is a very intense uptake, you have a great likelihood of, of success. 
And in fact, this patient acquired a complete remission of disease after the treatment. We were all happy. Does it always happen like this? The answer is no, unfortunately. So uh, we have to ask ourselves if a high uptake on gallium dotatape at CT predicts the response to PRT, why is it that the same uptake in similar disease uh, ends up in such different results? We already know uh, from uh, also the work that has been um, presented uh, before uh, by Dr. Kostokoglu that only 60% of patients with a high uptake at gallium dotate respond to PRT. So is it time for a paradigm shift? I think so. Uh, I, I think we need from the, to go from the monodimensional assessment of the pure expression of the somatostatin receptor to a multidimensional assessment of the entire biology of the tumor. So uh, to uh, use a, a metaphor, there is more to a zebra than white and, and black stripes. So we have to ask ourselves when we uh, uh, approach these tumors, is it a zebra or not? What kind of zebra is it? There are many different kinds of zebra. Is it a slow zebra? Is it a fast one? Uh, is it a zebra that will have many baby zebras and they will run all over the place? Or uh, is it a zebra that will kick you to pieces? Uh, I mean, there are zebras who may be very aggressive even with their own kind. Um, and so we can diagnose a zebra by the hoof prints. And as you may imagine, this is a, a, tech, a strategy that will not allow you to gather much information. Or we can use a, a fingerprint, a molecular um, analysis, molecular genomic analysis, like a fingerprint. And we, we can even derive a, a, um, genomic analysis from a fingerprint. And uh, translating this metaphor of the fingerprint, uh, uh, the fingerprint advances to molecular fingerprint of, the, of a disease. So uh, basically, when we apply uh, a genomic strategy to the analysis of this, uh, uh, of this disease, we switch from a monodimensional assessment, which can be based on a single analyte which can be like the somatostatin receptor expression or chromogranin A uh, only, uh, which only uh, encompasses one of the aspects of the tumor to a strategy that encompasses all the characteristics of the tumor, the characteri characteristics of proliferation, of secretion, of uh, uh, angiogenesis, and so on. And so a, a, a multi-analyte uh, uh, will, will allow you to do that. So uh, a single piece of information versus a multiple simultaneous molecular measurement of tumor behavior, of course, uh, um, there's a big difference. Uh, um, so in genomic analysis, we developed a PRRT-specific uh, predictor of response. And we can say that this may mark the beginning of personalized era for PRRT. How did we build up this uh, predictor? Uh, it is a assessment of the blood, uh, circulating uh, genomic material, transcripts, uh, circulating in the blood at baseline. And uh, these genes are those genes that regulate the growth factor signaling and the metabolism of the tumor cell. And when we combine that with the KI67 at histopathology, we obtain this predictor that we tested in three prospective uh, lutetium cohort uh, and uh, uh, three independent cohorts, we found a predictive accuracy of 95%. And this is the result of the study that we recently published. And uh, in three independent cohorts, in Italy on the left, in the middle in Germany, and in the Netherlands, Rotterdam, on the right, you can see that the, in, the, in the blue curve, the patients who were predicted at baseline to respond to the treatment uh, had a very uh, favorable and much different progression-free survival than did patients who were predicted to fail. 95% accuracy, and uh, this is only valid for PRRT. This predictor doesn't work with other treatments, so it's specific. So how do we know if PRRT works, now that we said that we can enroll a patient for PRRT? Um, so monitoring the response to PRRT, we can use CT or MRI, uh, the symptomatology, the, um, the biomarkers such as chromogranin A, uh, the gallium dotatate PET CT, but how do they perform for in PRRT? in particular. 
Uh, this is an experience from Erasmus Medical Center where this treatment was invented uh, 25 years ago on more than 350 patients. So regarding morphologic imaging, doing CTs and MRIs for this treatment. Uh, so they demonstrated that doing just CT and MRIs uh, only become reliable in assessing what the response is at least three months after the end of PRRT. Um, basically, uh, complete or partial responses uh, at three months were stable at six months. 9% um, of the stable patients at three months were in, categorized as progressive at three weeks. So as you can see from this picture, uh, the, the lesion only shrinks much later than uh, the early after the end of treatments. And what about chromogranin A? First of all, only, only. 265 out of 350 patients were positive. But what's more important is that 30% of these patients had a, a, a greater than 20% increase after the first cycle, regardless of the response that they would show thereafter. So that confused the issues. And also, there was no difference among the response groups in the levels of chromogranin A du during P P PRT cycle. So, uh, alterations of chromogranin A levels do not, are not reliable during PRRT and are also interfered by um, um, proton pump inhibitors or somatostatin analogs thereafter. So what about the NET test? We talked about the NET test this morning. I think there was some uh, probable misconception and misinformation uh, regarding uh, the, the NET test. Uh, the NET test uh, is actually very sensitive and very capable in monitoring the response or the progression, particularly in this case I'm showing the PRRT. So um, basically, as you can see here, uh, the division, the, the course of the net test uh, according to the tumor response after PRRT. This is in 158 patients. In responders, you can see the, bl the blue curve. The net test values significantly decrease during the therapy and in the follow up. Whilst uh, in uh, the patients who do not respond to PRRT, there is no decrease in, uh, in the first three cycles. And then uh, there is a significant increase in the net test value after the third cycle. And what about combining the predictor test with the net test? What do we uh, end up with? Well, it is very interesting because, uh, as you can see, um, in the patients who were predicted to respond to PRRT, the net test values are consistently declining, while in the patient predicted to, uh, to not to respond to PRRT, the values are increasing. So this is uh, mirroring the final clinical result, and uh, so the net test values are consistent with the predictor. And uh, the same holds true for the, um, the PFS, so uh, patients uh, uh, which, uh, in, in whose the net test levels go down, um, um, there is a, a longer PFS, whilst in patients who, in, whose, in which the net, net test levels go up, there is a lower uh, PFS. So, uh, basically, the net test monitoring of PRRT will facilitate the disease management, uh, not only for PRRT, but for any therapy. Is it PRRT useful in G3 neuroendocrine neoplasia? The answer is yes. I think it's better to reserve this for the discussion. Um, what is the challenge for the next years? We need to have a, a registered product that we can use in bronchopulmonary neuroendocrine tumors and in pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. Uh, there are new trials, uh, we will see a few hints in a moment, uh, uh, new randomized control trials and new prospective trials that we need. One is the COMPETE trial, uh, other, other trials in other clinical situations to establish the position of PRRT in the clinical algorithms of the neuroendocrine tumor. And new strategies have to be validated, like combinations, intraarterial PRRT, and new theranostics like the somatostatin receptor antagonist, we'll see in a moment, and the personalization of treatment based on risk factors, FDG status, uh, dosimetry, and the genomic specific prediction of response. 
What about intratidial PRT? Intratidial PRT has been uh, uh, experimented first in uh, Germany. As you can see, this is the result of their study, a small cohort of patients, but a very, uh, very effective strategy with 60% objective response. Um, this strategy is, uh, of course, uh, effective because uh, it's a focused delivery. The results are encouraging. The, it's still an underused approach. Um, there is a, a study ongoing at UCSF at the moment, and we will start a, a trial soon at Memorial Sloan Kettering. What about JR11, the somatostatin receptor antagonist, which do not internalize, so the radioactivity stays outside of the cells, but it stays outside in a much greater amount than with normal uh, uh, somatostatin receptor uh, analogs. Uh, this is the result of the phase one study conducted at Memorial on 20 uh, heavily pretreated patients. This study was supported by the Net Research Foundation. And uh, after only one cycle of treatment, there was an incredible response, disease control, disease control uh, of uh, greater than 80%. So uh, this, of course, uh, um, is a favorable response which uh, um, justifies the continuation. And in fact, we will have very soon also in America the OPS-201 trial, which is the phase one, two multicentric randomized trial of JR11 labeled with lutetium-177 in neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and uh, we will start soon. It's already started in Europe and Australia. And the last hint that I wanted to give is uh, uh, something more, uh, uh, less advanced in, in research, but very interesting. The long-acting radiolabel somatostatin analogs, the lutetium dota eb tate, it's something that circulates in the blood much longer, and so it delivers lot more radiations to the tumor. Uh, it, they, it has been estimated that uh, there is almost an eight-fold increase in the tumor dose uh, delivery. So, in conclusion, this is the New York in 2016 uh, when I arrived here. PRT was about uh, to be launched, but it wasn't present yet. Uh, so, what happened in these two years? Uh, PRT has been accepted in the clinical algorithms of the major scientific societies. It is now approved for gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, in small intestine based on a randomized controlled trial, in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors based on non-controlled trials. Uh, still, we need to answer the question of when to initiate PRRT, when and how to appropriately administer PRRT, how to improve the treatment delivery. Uh, we need prospective trials in other clinical scenarios to establish the position in the treatment algorithm. Uh, we need uh, to objectively assess and validate the new strategies, such as intraarterial, uh, new peptides, and so on. But my, um, my recommendation is to not to take a chance anymore. No more taking a chance with treatments and assessing the outcome. Let's use predictors, efficient predictors, uh, to assess the feasibility and to monitor the efficacy and tolerability of the treatment for molecular genomic uh, analysis, for example, the liquid biopsy, the net test, for example, and the predictor in conjunction with imaging. And uh, now, uh, this is the New York in 2018, post-PRRT, uh, with all the isotopes scintillating all over the city. And uh, the last thing, probably we have to move, be move beyond the horse and the car strategy. I would like to thank you all, to thank the group I work with, the groups I work with, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.